Superstar, I want to try, try to hit a fight, yeah. We got it. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway. Uh, good looking audience. Yes. So, very good looking audience. That's a good thing about the under 37. It's always our best looking audience. Uh, uh, oh man, when I was growing up, I had a, I had a place in that that was like a, a periodic table that I had requested to like, memorize everyone else. So I was always interested in like science and everything else there. But, uh, but yeah, at least I kind of got it. And you got your first pen when you were 13. What was that pen? Uh, yeah, so that was uh, actually for a uh, water recycling device, of all things, like completely unrelated to any of those laser technology and stuff. But anyways, actually, we have uh, Mr. Beast, you know, you guys, I'm sure everybody here knows that. Yeah, that's um, exactly. Not, not here today. Uh, Kevin Hart is, uh, is amazing. He's going to be helping out actively. Um, you know, we have uh, also Enrique Dubogras, you, know, you guys may know from, from Morning Canvas Panel. Who's ready to wake and bake? Let's go. Show of hands. Um, we have an amazing panel with three founders from all different aspects and parts of the cannabis industry. Let's just start. What is the current state of the legal cannabis business? Hannah, you're next to me, so you guys, you're the first victim. Um, I would say the current state is pretty cautiously optimistic. Um, we've been waiting for federal reform for a really long time in the industry. I think for context, Cannabis is legal medically in over 35 markets. I think it's really around, I think, again, this is a really big industry. There's a lot of different areas to invest in the industry. We have some investors that historically played in the tech market that look at what we call ancillary cannabis companies. So companies that are not necessarily making cannabis products, but certainly have a business model that supports the industry. Uh, we have private equity firms coming in. These, again, are should be cash flow generating businesses. They're right for, for private equity investment. And then you also have public equities, which continue to be incredibly reasonable for their growth. No, I, I mean, I think we're kindred spirits. I think, we, I think we're better together than we are apart. Look, the plant-based industry, the other issue with the plant or challenge in the plant-based industry is the categories are broken up into like three pieces. The legacy brands, the Gardein, the Morning Stars, the Boca, the Mushroom Burgers. Yep. Been around 20 years, declining. I was going to say, um, I think it's more value than price. I think we, haven't, we have not really got across the value proposition. It's a hard one, right? Zero cholesterol, so it's better for you. You're not killing animals and you're saving the planet. It's clunky. about the fact that you didn't fit the CEO mold in any way. Beyond sheer tenacity and hard work, what were some of the strategies that you learned over time to be able to make the inroads and to defy convention the way that you did? Well, Moira, thanks for having me and thank you, Forbes. I'm so excited to be here. I didn't know I could go build a million dollar business, let alone a billion dollar business. And so one of the things that I feel like first and foremost, the thing that probably one of the hardest lessons that I learned is the fact that you just need to dream bigger. And you can't be what you can't see. And that's just why I'm so excited to be up here with Renee today as well, because it's so important that we see success that is not just pale, male, and stale. And so I never, ever felt like I fit the mold of, of CEO. I started a company with just an idea and scaled it to not just a billion in value, but exited the company as its founder. And so just that journey over the last 10 years was the greater represented communities really need to leverage community and relationships to really scale because that's what's really gonna help us catapult. So that's probably, I would say, some tactical pieces that I could give you is that it, you think that it gets, you know, it gets easier as you grow and you know, at every level when you have X amount of employees, when you have X amount of funding, you're gonna raise over 500 million in venture capital. It never got easier, you just get better. 
And so truly not just showing up every day for whatever mountain comes, it's what's, you know, how you're going to get to the end goal. Decided to opt out of the 2020 season, height of your career, to be able to focus on social justice reform. And you took a step further when you became a co-owner of the WNBA team, Atlanta Dream. And now you're pursuing that another chapter in terms of your work in the venture capital space to really um, uh, focus on underrepresented founders. You bridge so many gaps in, in terms of your career, activism, entrepreneurship, and the like. How did you translate your success across so many different arenas? Yeah, well, first of all, what's up, everybody? Listen, I'm used to sports. in your life like if you've taken an L give me a hand because I bet you nobody in here is taking more L's than me and I think that's what sports teaches you like I had to learn to take a no I had to learn to take an L so in sports I mean we kind of almost all right at UConn we went 39 and 0 we went undefeated but that's rare so you kind of know that you're going to take a loss somewhere along the lines so I kind of took the same mentality that I had in sports because in sports, like imagine if somebody quit in sports every time they, they lost, right? Like that's crazy. We watched people lose last night. You know, the WBA Finals is going on right now, but there's another game, there's game two coming up. So for me, I kind of took that same mentality that I had in sports where it's like, every day I prepare a certain way and I carry myself a certain way. So when I opted out, that was almost different than what people expected of me because when you're the captain of a team, people kind of expect you to stay in line, do the right thing all the time, but sometimes the right thing is going to get something. So that's kind of what happened with me in 2020 because all of these jobs that she just mentioned that I have, a co-owner, vice president of the professional sports league, have my own foundation, you know, I've been a general partner in a venture capital firm. I didn't have training for any of those things. I went to school for communications, okay? So the reason that I say that is because my training in sports and how I carried myself helped me be able to prepare for whatever happens in life, like where people may not look like you or act like you, or particularly for women where there's a much narrow band of, of acceptable behavior as it, as it relates to business. Um, one of the things I love that you have said is you have to go from moment to momentum. I might get on the freeway and start on this lane, but then it's looking open over there in the fast lane, so maybe I might have to skirt, skirt, hit the fast lane, pull back over, that's how I spin. I don't know where, I don't know which lane I'm going to be everyone. <laughs> I am so thrilled to be here with these panelists uh, because, as I think everyone here knows, uh, the news about Hollywood has been buzzier than usual this year. Just a few weeks ago, the Writers Guild reached an agreement with major studios and streamers ending nearly 150 days strike. Um, yes. <laughs> Definite applause. However, the one caveat here is that the Actors Guild, or SAG, is still on strike, and its members include the three lovely panelists that I have here today. So, just incredibly lucky for us uh, is that these three panelists are more than actors. They're producers, they're writers, they're founders, they're multi-talented. So we have a ton of stuff to talk about. A lot of difficult um, conversations that need to be had, but I'm really glad we're in this space right now. The last time that we had direct was six years ago, and I think that, you know, we can really change some things when it comes to the industry based off of the strike, so I'm excited for filmmaking. Yeah. Well, you know what's going to be nice? Something like a film being adapted or something like a star-driven play. You know, those things are always hits on Broadway, but, but something special and unique like Ain't No Mo mm -hmm. is something that I think needs to be on Broadway, but doesn't necessarily have, Broadway doesn't necessarily have the tools to support it. And so I think we ask the question of how we can fix that issue and, and how we can start to, to change the industry from the inside out. And I think that that's... The level in which we see our stories where trauma is not just attached to it or you know, our race or our identity, whatever, is not just attached to it, where we're just able to exist and just be. Um, and I think that we're in this really exciting time right now. We're seeing a lot of oh, this won't work or that doesn't, that isn't a thing or you can't do that on television and then end up getting Emmy nominations. You know what I mean? And it's like, but you told me I couldn't do it though. You told me I couldn't do it though. You know? And I think that's the key to, to what, what we have inside of us and to questions like this. It's like really just making our own land, just like these two are doing, you know? Yeah.
Yeah. And to that, I would also add that we will then challenge what the norm is to show up for us because we really, what you need to make a show, sadly, is capital, right? You need to put, to put on a Broadway production, you need multiple millions of dollars. And that's a very real, tangible thing that systemically we are at. Uh, uh, we are at an imbalance there, period. So I think it's like when we make our own. So, great. This isn't like CBD water or anything. No, no, you can drink, you can drink all of it. So, uh, I've been looking. The matters of the heart and the spirit are so important to you. In, in, in light of all the success you've had, in your chosen profession as an actor? Well, I, I write about it a little bit in this last book, Soul Boom, and a little bit more in my previous book, but I, I had a lot of mental health issues uh, when I was young, when I was in my 20s. Idiots. Um, and back in the 90s, when I was in my 20s, uh, they didn't talk about mental health. That, that wasn't a thing. It wasn't really, there weren't podcasts and apps and, Tequila, an interviewer, Moira Forbes, president and publisher, Forbes Women and EVP, Forbes. Kendall, thank you. Thanks for having me. So as you all know, Kendall Jenner is only 27 years old, but she began her career, and her career has lasted almost two-thirds of her life, which is extraordinary. It's been defined by hard work. I'm in a chapter of self-discovery. I feel like I'm also in a really transitional period in my life, um, spiritually, work-wise, mentally. Like, I think I'm just kind of really coming into my own. I, I feel the self-discovery self aspect of it, I'm really excited about. I think I'm, I think we all, as we get older, obviously discover ourselves. And I'd be curious, have you ever felt overshadowed by your family's brand? Never overshadowed, I think that, I think that one thing that we all have that's really beautiful, we all being me and my sisters and my family, is there's never been a competitiveness between any of us. You. I think it goes along with the growth. I think, again, as I've gotten older and, and being 27 now, although I have so much more to learn, I think that I've come to a place now at 27 where I've never felt more comfortable with myself. And I think that's what's kind of fit in so well of, you know, me transitioning into this entrepreneurial side of myself. I think that it's only kind of worked for me better that way. And um, I just feel really, really happy with where I'm at. So. Um, I think I can't be lying if I said I haven't had moments of self-doubt and moments of, you know, confusion of who am I. Assistant Managing Editor, Founders, Forbes. How's everyone doing? I said, how's everyone doing, I asked. All right, everyone ready for the money, the big money panel? <laughs> All right, we got three amazing entrepreneurs that have their fingers on the pulse of the financial environment, especially what Gen Z, what the young money is doing. Vivian, you're next to me, so you can start. You're the first victim. What is the state of the of the Gen Z? What's the financial life of the Gen Z or like right now? Yeah, I think generations before Gen Z had seen an economic system that worked. They went to school. They were then able to get a good job, survive on one income, and then have that two and a half kids, golden retriever, white picket fence, half life. And then millennials and Gen Z are starting to feel like the system doesn't necessarily work the way that it was designed because we have a student debt crisis, housing is 3X. Your financial identity doesn't necessarily determine where you come from, uh, where you end up in life. So as it relates to Gen Z, there's a hopelessness as it relates to what are we saving for in our country. We've seen skyrockets in interest rates, whereby a lot of things just feel like it's been drawn down from you. All you have for people who are running startups, running P&Ls, 
and maybe they have bootstrapping, maybe they're venture, maybe they venture, you know, tough times, everyone wants profit now, interest rates, what, what advice do all you have to managing not just your own money, but your company's money? Yeah. I think Vivian might have an idea on this. Yeah, we had a fun little chat about this backstage. Uh, stay lean for as long as humanly possible. I know Diane Brady, Assistant Managing Editor, Community and Leadership, Forbes. Wait, people know you. Hi, guys. Um, wake up. We are here to announce that Pinky's pregnancy, by the way. So, no, not pregnant. I think you're due pretty soon. I am. I'm seven months pregnant. So, let me tell y'all something. It's funny to cheer. I've been pregnant 2020, 2021. 25 million dollars. My company is valued at 100 million dollars. I'm going to get the Forbes cover, okay? Because yeah. anything that I touch turns to gold, and I knew that that's what I wanted. So sometimes you really got to manifest those things. So like, I was led with a rude awakening because Diane was like, "I'm sorry, we we can't give you the cover." And I'm like, "What you mean you can't give me the cover? I got the hottest business in America sorry, right now." These are precious things. <laughs> like, we are interested in you, but we don't. But then you came back. Because normally you'd say like, no thank you, but then you said, okay, fine. I did, so, so I came back, um, and I came back because I learned a very valuable lesson about being an entrepreneur in business, and it's called humility. And it was very hard to do, because I, I'm always so confident in my business, but I realized, when I burn a bridge now, that I need to walk past and walk through later, or go with the flow, build a relationship, and still have a great outcome in the end. And it was such a great outcome, y'all. I ended up having a three-page spread in Forbes magazine. Diane didn't tell me this yet, but I'm gonna get the cover one day, right? But we're on stage today. Yeah, we're on stage. <laughs> and and it's a great opportunity. So my message to everybody in the audience is, shoot your shot always, but learn as an entrepreneur that it's okay to pivot, and it does not mean that you fail. It just means you do things a little bit differently, and it will still take you to the next level. A dream job, y'all. I was making $5,000 a week as a casting director. So I'm thinking I'm doing well, right? So like here I am, I'm almost 30 years old. Um, I'm doing all the things that I wanted to do, but I realized my dream was calling people sluts. <laughs> and that was your dream, to call people dream. sluts? So it wasn't much of a vegan, it was the opportunity to say slut on a daily basis? That too, but um, <laughs> it was really helping people to reimagine food. Right. And I had no idea that five years ago I would be creating something that would suit me a household name. And I didn't know what I was doing then. And I think I'm not the only person that can say, sometimes I don't know what I'm doing now, y'all. But it works as an entrepreneur. And in the last five years, I've been able to open up 13 locations. At the end of the day, we have a very healthy household. Um, and my kids are happy, and that's all that matters. So I want to ask quickly, Danny Meyer, yes. Yes, I'm very happy. Um, how important, I know Danny Meyer investing speaks very highly. Are there, are there other people you'd point to, or Danny, what has he done for your business? Um, let me tell you something about affiliation. Uh huh. When you are in the rooms with the right people, you don't even have to say a word. Danny Meyer, if you don't know who that is, he created Shake Shack. So he is like the Michael Jordan of the restaurant industry. So to be able to stand alongside him and have him as an investor 
is one of the biggest blessings ever because I got the cheat code. Like if, if you run with the best, you're gonna be the best. And when you professionally get in bed with these people, you gotta make sure that you like them, that you can work with them, that they understand what your needs are, and that they actually help you because it's not just about money. Yeah. And what I can say about my investors is we have built such a great relationship, I can pick up the phone and call them at any time beyond the dollar and they can get me all the relationships that I need to grow my business. What? Eh, hemos decidido que todas las propuestas y todo lo, lo que presentaron aquí eran merecedor de ganar, pero eh, nosotros optamos por Celia. Yeah. Yeah. not guaranteed to last, so I think perseverance and consistency are what I'm working on next. And, and you stop. Like I said, literally just 13, 14 months ago, I wanted to quit absolutely everything. I had no money. I, I couldn't pay my rent. I was traveling to, to do shows for 30 people in a state that I was going to make zero money doing, just doing it because I enjoyed it, and I just was hoping it was going to pay off. And pay attention to Pay attention to the little signs and the little victories, because I don't, whatever you want to call it, if you want to call it, whatever you believe in, fate, destiny, God, religion, whatever your thing is that, that, that seems to drive you towards, it makes you feel like you're supposed to be doing what you're doing. I had so many moments that I was, I was literally on like my last month's rent, right, where I was like, this is it, I, I, have, I have to just commit to getting a nice Hello, thank you for having me. I serve as the CEO and co-founder of the Fearless Fund, which is the world's first venture capital fund built by women of color for women of color. And What we do, due to the racial disparities that exist, women of color are the most founded entrepreneurial demographic, just the least funded. Unfortunately, I look forward to the day when I can say most founded, most funded. You know, a young man in university, we talk about the early days, because a lot of people here, it's the start of where they want to go and raise money. What do you think are some of the not very much money because your business is sort of very strong business fundamentally, but also at lower or more fair valuations uh, because uh, the ideal sort of valuation trajectory for a company is that it goes up sort of you know constantly, let's say, but in a small amount every time. It's far worse to say like, hey, you know, I'm going to raise at a really high valuation and then be there for five or ten years. That's actually I know, totally we're common. Sarah, do you agree? Because you you have a lot of people. That's your ten thousand hours, right? A lot of people come to you ideas. What's your philosophy? What do you like to see? I think that it's important to raise the money you need to achieve your next set of milestones when you'll be able to raise more. I think that, you know, raising too little is certainly not good. You run out of money, your company goes out of business, game over. Um, raising too much cannot be good. You end up just sort of handing it all to Facebook ad dollars or, you know, whatever you're spending it on. Um, and, and so you have to be mindful of What's the reasonable growth? What's the reasonable valuation?
and then we're looking right now for a partner in debt. And you were the first in who was here yesterday. This is, uh, you gave Pinky her start. I should point that out. I did, no, no, no. I can't take quick credit for giving her her start. Oh, she got her start. <laughs> she got her start, but then you were important. Yes. At what stage do you need the money? Well, and he was backstage telling me that in 2016, when Under 30 was in Philly, he actually snuck in. Yeah. Right? And then in 2017, the next year, he launched his company, Jeans. Now this is a company that's raised over 200 million. Silver Lake is an investor. Disney CEO Bob Iger is an investor. Kyrie Irving is an investor. Victor Oladipo, is he still in it? Yeah, yeah, he's an investor. It's been endorsed by Cardi B and Offset. Genies ain't no joke, and he came up with it in Philly. <laughs> True. Not quite, but... Yeah. Um, <laughs> Genies is an avatar company. And I want to start this panel by asking you, define what is an avatar company for me and those people out there that don't know. Yeah, I think the word avatar is, has such a wild interpretation by most people. At the end of the day, most people have thought avatars in the past to be a sticker pack or some type of profile picture or like an animation. To us, an avatar is the future of digital identity. And I feel like the way that incumbents typically talk about identity, it falls on deaf ears. But if we imagine a world where we're with our AR glasses or our headsets, whatever the next computing device is going to be, we feel like an avatar is going to be the next username. All right, this is awesome. We just heard from Matt Wright, and he was saying he was an overnight success, 12 years in the making. He was grinding it out. Both of you found viral success you know, over the pandemic. I want to hear from both of you, what sparked that? Going from kind of obscurity to suddenly having thousands of fans in the room, let alone millions of fans out there. I mean, for me, it was kind of this past year that everything took off and I was trying so hard on social media for years, uh, which is why I feel like it's such an honor to be here and be recognized because I think that you know, it can be inspiring for other people because I've really had a love for posting and, you know, I post three to four times a day, every day, and I feel like it was kind of a snowball effect and took off over time, um, but it was really this past year for me that made a big difference and got me to where I am today, but, you know, just doing what you love and sticking to it because, you know, it's not always going to come right away, overnight. Just for you, was there one video that kind of took off or was it more gradual like Alex was saying? Um, I think the whole time during like the pandemic, that was really like everybody's time to tune into everything I was doing. I know COVID had such a bad effect, but like COVID was great for me, man. I, <laughs> you know, I was trying to feel like I couldn't breathe. I mean, shit. Um, yeah, nah, it, it just made everybody stay in the house and not so much coming on television because nobody's out like recording stuff. So. The main thing was everybody watching anything on social media, so I took that time and I just went full fledged and like, bro, didn't even, I never let up. Wow. And once you both had this, these amazing platforms, these followers, suddenly you have this marketing machine built in for free. How did you take it so much on this stuff? Live tours, you know, TV, you name it. How, what advice, how did you guys jump from, wow, I have all these followers, to like, let's build some business on this? I mean, at first, I really knew, like, I wanted to try and monetize off of social media, and this was my junior year of college. I was reaching out to so many management brands, and they all were denying me, and they're like, you don't have enough followers, like, we're too busy right now, like, we don't have time for you, and I was like, okay, like, whatever, I kept trying, and finally, you know, I found a great manager, and she was all the way in Australia, but I was like, you know what, this works for me, like, and... I was able to start monetizing off of it and I think that's when I started to kind of take it a little bit more seriously and realize that you can kind of build a business out of social media and you know that's where I like got my start but it, I would say to anyone who's trying to do that that you know don't give up and I got rejected by so many places before you know someone accepted me and I think having a good team behind you when you're you know working on social media is super important just because you know, you want to make sure that you're getting into the right things and you're not getting into like a contract that's going to end up like screwing you over. So I think that's super important. Drew, you got a lot going on. Yeah. Give me, give everyone here a little summary of this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
Yeah, yeah, thank God, thank God. Thank God. Uh, speaking of contracts, I heard a little overheard her say that. Uh, could have been records, one of my businesses. <laughs> Not sure if y'all know about could have been records. Yeah, you know, I'm a businessman. I think uh, it's, it's the first thing first, you gotta get that funny money, man. So uh, over this time, I'm working with like companies like Nike, Raisin Cane's, Google Pixel, to name a few. Not trying to be cocky. Yeah, just, <laughs> just saying. But, uh, my goal is definitely not to connect with everybody. And in fact, like I like to be a fire starter. Um, you know, when the environment is cold, I like the spark. People gather around it. They uh, can either tell stories about how much they're uncomfortable with what this fire is doing, or they can add to it, or they can take from it. I might get burned in the process of starting a fire, but ultimately, it it gives you know more than it takes. So I, I, I'm okay with. Uh, doing things that kind of shake up what the, what's going on in the culture. And you need that, you know, you need someone to stir the pot. I'm about to truck and I throw with some hands, you know You can skip the introduction, I'm introverted, I don't want you to stack it up tall as a mountain is I put money on trees like a botanist